Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We want to thank you, Elder Skeet, for joining us again for one more mm-hmm. segment. I know that uh, God has blessed us through you here thus far. And um, before we go any further and we attempt to, to ask you some of these questions, would you be willing to have an opening uh, yes, prayer for of course. us? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We can come to you freely in the name of Jesus Christ. I ask you now, dear God, remember the promise of James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Grant me that wisdom and the pastor, that we may answer these questions to your satisfaction and to the blessing of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we were looking through some of these, there's everything from uh, last day events to relationships. And so uh, I can't say they'll be in any order, but here we go. It's, the first question is, uh, what more events are still to come to pass before the second coming of Jesus? Well, there's several events that have yet to come to pass. One is the Sunday law. One is the close of probation. We have no date for that. The other is the seven last plagues. Another one is the little time of trouble. There's the time of Jacob's trouble. All these things have to come to pass before Jesus comes. And so there are quite a few. But don't wait until you see them in order to make yourself right with God. Because you may pass away tonight, God forbid. But we cannot wait until tomorrow or the day after. Today, tonight, now, as you sit where you sit, is the time to connect with God in such a way that if you close your eyes in death, the next time you open them, you'll see him as a savior, not as a judge. But again, the things that still have to happen, the Sunday law, the little time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble, the, uh, the, um, the seven last plagues, of course, will occur after probation has closed. And so all of these things still have to happen. Thank you so much. Uh, here's and one. of course, may I add, the cancellation of religious freedom in the United States. That has to happen. The cancellation of religious freedom and the establishment of an image to the beast in the United States. Thank you. And the next question is, uh, this is, I think, from someone who was um, convicted from last night. Uh, how, do, how to start, how, may, how can I continue to build a character and maintain it? that is honorable to God. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph one, Ella White writes, the scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Also in that prayer, Jesus said in John 17, verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Jesus prayed to the Father and asked the Father to keep you and me from the evil in this world. Having said that to the Father, then Jesus tells the Father how to do it. In verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In the same prayer, Jesus goes on to say regarding himself, verse 19, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself. And so he sanctified himself through the truth. This is the method whereby we can grow in the character of Jesus Christ. Outside of the word, there's no power to do that. Amen. This person asks, how can we know if we are with God or with Satan? By their fruits, ye shall know them. Very simple. By their fruits, ye shall know them. The indwelling of Christ produces the life of Christ in speech, behavior, everything else. The indwelling of Satan produces the works of Satan. Now, sometimes the works of Satan can look like the works of Christ. So we need to have discernment. But we are told, by their fruits you shall know them. And so you may know that you are of Christ simply by your attitude towards God's law. Do you obey God? If the answer is yes, there's Christ within you. Do I disobey God? Then Christ is not the ruling power. Not do I make a mistake from time to time. Is disobedience my lifestyle? If the answer is yes, 
then Christ is not the ruling power in the life. I'm not saying he has abandoned you completely because once he does that, your probation has closed. But surely he is not the controlling force. The evidence that he is, is your and my conformity with his law. Amen. In other words, obedience is proof of the indwelling of Jesus Christ. There was a few of these uh, questions, so we just kind of narrowed it down to one. Mm. And this person is asking um, tips on memorizing Scripture and doing daily devotions. Any, any uh, tips? Right, memorizing Scripture, well, for me, is simply a matter of constant practice. In Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 601, paragraph 4, Ella White writes, that which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy and right thoughts and actions become habitual. That which at first seems difficult by constant repetition grows easy. And so my approach is constant repetition, constant repetition. We call that practice makes perfect. Elamite also says putting Bible verses to music is an effective way to memorize the Bible. I don't do that, but it works for some people. You may write verses down, and by physically involving yourself in that process, you aid retention of the verse. In other words, you're involved physically, you're involved mentally. And so writing it down on three by five, carrying them with you, looking at them from time to time, excellent way. But my simple method is look at it, understand it, look away, look again, and then anchor it in the head. But I think the key is discipline. You must, there are four Ds I recommend. First D, desire. You, it's difficult to stop someone from doing something that he or she really wants to do, good or bad. And so when they were building the Tower of Babel, God said, behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Only God could have stopped them. They were so determined. You look at the seven last plagues. Plague number, any of the seven plagues. Even though the people are suffering, they're still blaspheming God because they are at that point determined not to honor God. Now you reverse that. You look at Daniel, the three Hebrew boys. They were determined to honor God even in the face of death. Mm -hmm. How determined? Do you have a desire to do it? That's number one, desire. Number two, Discipline. Discipline simply means if it's raining, I do it. If there's an earthquake, I do it. If I'm dead, I do it. Nothing gets in the way of doing it. You remember the old Nike saying, what was it? That's discipline. That is what is taught in the army. You don't go to war and say, well, I don't feel like shooting, have an upset stomach. No, 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 no. Regardless of how many bombs are bursting and bullets are whizzing past your head, you have to be there to defend your country. And so there's desire. There's discipline. There is determination. I am not giving up. If it takes me six months to memorize John 11.35, I will take six months. And that verse simply says Jesus wept. And so you have determination. For those of you who watch football, when the running back has the ball, and there are five guys holding on to him, where is he headed for that goal line? They're hitting him, he drags them, he, is, he just wants to cross the plane, that's all. Touchdown. That's where we must be. And the fourth D is divine help. Ask God to bless your efforts, and he will do that because by trying to memorize, you'll be doing something he wants you to do. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thank you so much. This next, next question... Oh, by the way, let me throw this in. <laughs> sorry, sorry. When I go to the gym, I've said, you've probably heard me say that on some YouTube sermon. If I do a set of bench presses, when I get off the machine... Instead of just sitting there doing, I recite a passage. In that minute of recuperation, I recite. I may take a passage like Revelation 15, just eight verses, say it twice. Then go another set. 
I may pick one verse and say it for my entire, one passage for the entire workout. If I'm doing lat pull downs, I do a set when I'm finished, Psalm 126, Psalm 110, whatever, I just do it so that I use the time wisely. I'm said that, I said that to say this, people say I don't have the time, you can find the time. How long does it take to take a shower? Five minutes? You have five minutes to recite. Is this microphone working? Amen. You have five minutes. To, how long does it take to brush your teeth? A minute and a half? You can recite something. I'm not joking. I'm serious. How long does it take you to eat? If you're not talking to someone, you recite something while you're eating. How long does it take to walk from dormitory to this sanctuary? Recite something. When you go to bed at night, do you fall asleep immediately? No. While you're lying in the dark, recite until you fall asleep. So that the last thing on your mind is the word of God to protect you from the devil who attacks you at night. Let me tell you something about the word of God and his power to protect you night or day, but particularly night. I was in a certain country preaching. A young lady came to me. She said, uh, I am bothered by spirits at night. They come, they bother me, they molest me, all these things. She said, I haven't slept in weeks. I gave her 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I told her, confess all known sins. Before sleeping, take this verse, say it, say it. Think about it. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I say, say that. Fall asleep saying it. She came to me the next day. She said, I slept for the first time in months. Amen. This in your head is power against Satan. Amen. Let me add something else without preaching. All created beings were made by the Word of God. Angels were made by the Word of God. Lucifer was made by the Word of God. He's now Satan. The thing that made him must be greater than he is. Are you with me? This made Satan. This has more power than he has. This is what he's scared of. Not on the shelf, but in here this. And so Jesus said in Matthew 8, 16, or the Bible says of Jesus, and when the even was come, they brought unto him all that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits, how? With his word. What did Jesus normally say to demon-possessed people or to the spirit? Come out! That's the word. And what did the demons do? They came out. Okay. Amen. This person asks, um, how can I practically detach myself from amusements of this world? Some of these amusements might not even be bad in themselves, but they're still distracting me from God. They don't have to be. They may appear not bad in themselves, but anything that takes you from God is not good. Or anyone that takes you from God is not good. I go back to the Word of God. I will always take you to the simple Word of God. To detach yourself from the attractions, the allurements of the world, expose yourself to the world. It is the counteracting agent. Mm -hmm. Study this. Read it. Dwell upon it. It will change your mind. It really will. And Eloi says, our minds take the shape of the things we feed it. Or the shape of the constitution or the nature Feed your mind with this, and your desire for the things of the world will fade. Mysteriously fade. This. And add to this the writings of Ellen White. Did anybody say amen? Amen. <laughs> As a young person, messages to young people. As a young person, letters to young lovers. And generally, steps to Christ. Read chapter 5 first. 
then read the whole book. Amen. Uh, this question says, the Bible is clear about being slothful and lazy. How can I become the opposite of that? I know where you're going with this. To the Bible, yes. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do. Who can finish the verse? Do it with thy might. The answer to laziness is work. You ask God, change my mindset and give me a hardworking mind. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, you are morally required to do it well. What's that key word? Morally. Laziness is immorality in inaction, <laughs> if I can put it like that. A lazy person is behaving immorally. Immorality is more than thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not kill. All ten commandments are moral commandments. Sabbath breaking is immorality. Are you looking at me or past me? Sabbath breaking is immoral behavior. Honor thy father, thy mother. By the way, your father and your mother include the older members of the church. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 1. Against an elder, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the elder women as mothers, the younger men as brothers, and the women as sisters. So the Bible says, what did Jesus say? Who is my mother? Who is my father? Who are my brothers? Those who obey me. The elder members of the church are father and mother spiritually. Honor thy father and thy mother, disrespect to them is immoral behavior. Fornication is not the only act of immorality people can perform at any age, whether you're youth or not, but you're all young, I'm talking to you. Disrespect for authority is immoral behavior. All right. Uh, this person asks, how can I overcome the sinful desire of lust? Okay. Where am I going? <laughs> Back to the Bible. <laughs> yes. The Tenth Commandment says, thou shalt not covet. Lust is a desire for something that should not be longing for. The conquest the, of this, the answer, listen to uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 100, paragraph 1. If studied and obeyed. The word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. What did Jesus pray? Sanctify them. Sanctification is the act of removing spiritual impurities from the life. Jesus tells the Father, do it through this. In John 15, in speaking to his disciples, Jesus tells them, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Paul, to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. There is no way to finagle your way around the word. For every spiritual crisis, the word. Even God himself has magnified his word above his name. The greatest proof that Christ was who he said he was weren't the miracles he performed, but that he fulfilled every Old Testament prophecy about Christ. The word, the greatest evidence of God's presence is his word, not a miracle, because Satan can perform miracles, but Satan cannot produce truth. Start the solution to your problems with the word of God, studied and obeyed. The power is released in obedience. Amen. Uh, you already answered the first part of this question, so I'll mm. modify it a little bit. Right. This person has a, sees the truth and knows it's important. Mm. They feel that their heart is out of harmony with it, and they do not uh, see a purpose for their life. Um, 
how can you help or give guidance on someone finding the their purpose, purpose? The purpose, the, the purpose, the person sees no purpose for life. It seems as though sees the truth. they sees the truth, mm -hmm. but it says, therefore, they, um, they see every moment is uh, fleeting, whether it's good or bad, uh -huh. and um, they're just seeing, they don't, they don't understand their purpose for their life. Okay, everyone has a purpose for life. Uh, Genesis 1.26 states that purpose, let us make man in our image. But there's something else that person can do. Listen carefully. If you feel no conviction, ask God to place the conviction on your heart. Ask him to do it. The very first promise of the Bible is Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Ask God to put within you a hatred for all that is unlike Christ. If you do not feel the conviction, ask God because your carnal nature will never produce a conviction to do right. Because the flesh is all flesh. Let me say it again. The, listen to the carnal nature. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Not one good thing in that list. Your carnal nature will never convict you to obey God. You need input from outside of yourself. And that's Christ, the life of Christ. For those of you who do physics, you know this law is the third law of first, I don't recall. An object in motion or at rest tends to remain in motion or at rest unless acted upon by an external, an unbalanced force. In other words, objects do not like to change the inertia. So if that chair is sitting still, it will stay still unless an outside force changes its inertia because the chair has no power in itself to change its inertia. So if you roll a ball through the universe, it will roll and never stop unless something stops it. A sinner will sin unless an external force intervenes. That external force is Jesus. Are you with me? And so if there's no conviction, ask him because your nature will never supply a conviction to do right. When you disobey and disrespect your elders, it did not come from the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of Christ. And what actually says when your child is going through a tantrum, rebuke the evil spirit in that child. Because the Holy Spirit does not work like that. And so again, I keep harping on it. If you're not convicted, even though you see it intellectually, you're not touched by it, ask God. What did David pray and say? Psalm 51 verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God. He can't do it. Renew a right spirit. He cannot do it. Why does God write the law on our heart? Because we cannot write it. Worse than that, we don't want to write it. God has to do, ask him to place a conviction on your heart regarding the truth you intellectually see, but you're not committed to. Amen. Uh, the next question is, how do you know when a dream is from God? If it is consistent with the word of God. If you have a dream that tells you, go kill somebody, that's not from God. Are you following me? There are people who say, I hear voices, I saw this, I saw that, and I went and I killed all my family members. That's not from God. The Word of God is the ultimate test of anything. If you have a conviction from the Spirit and it's contrary to God's Word, it's from the wrong Spirit. So if you're receiving dreams and the dreams do not conflict with the Word of God, then there's some certainty the dream is from God. But if one iota of that dream, one microscopic sliver goes contrary to God's word, it is not from God. The, the test must be the word of God generally and the law specifically. Test everything by the word at large and the law particularly. All right. Uh, this next question I think this person understands the state of the dead and for those that um, choose to disobey God will be um, eventually destroyed. Mm -hmm. This is what they say. What is the point of striving for perfection in Christ and going to heaven if I can live a fun, sinful life and not burn in hell forever? 
since according to the Bible we return back to dust, ceasing yes. to exist forever. How is, how is uh, since there's no eternal punishment in regards to um, being tormented for all of eternity, um, and it says, um, can't really read this writing here, but it says, um, basically, why, why choose Christ if I can just have, have fun here on this earth? Okay. There's no eternal punishment, the person says. There is no eternal punishing, but there's an eternal punishment. You don't burn forever, but you're wiped out forever. Are you following me? That's eternal. Now, that's what the other side is, eternal life with no sin, no sickness, no disease, no war, no whatever, living with God face to face, traveling the universe with angels. That's the other option, and you're telling me, why strive for that? Then what spirit is driving you? God offers you life. You prefer death. God offers you blessings. You prefer curses. And the person said, why can't I have fun now? Well, you have to define fun the way God defines fun. In heaven, fun is consistent with the word of God. On the earth, fun is consistent with the words of Satan. You see, heaven and hell have two different dictionaries. What do you mean by fun? Smoking dope, you know, committing fornication, staying out loud, getting drunk. Is that fun? No converted mind calls that fun. That is designed to destruction. Are you following me? That's not fun. And so if you're willing to sacrifice a life without end of blessings in the very presence of God, you can travel through space, visit other planets where people never sin. There's no sickness, no disease. You look into the face of the angel Gabriel. You look into the face of God. You hang out with, Gabriel, with, with Abraham. You talk with Noah. You want to miss that? Just to smoke? You need to see a psychiatrist. Next question. Again, ask God to put in you a desire for the things he loves. Let me tell you something. On the day when Christ comes, you'll be glad you made that choice. Amen. I read in Ella White someplace, she said, the reason why God delays his judgments upon us and the final destruction of the world is because he knows it will be so terrible. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. Hebrews 10, 30, it's a fearful thing. When this loving God has had enough and he has to destroy, it will be terrible. Ask him to give you a desire for the life to come. Thank you. Uh, this person asks, what is your favorite Ellen White book and what is your favorite Bible verse? My favorite Ellen White book, I believe, is Steps to Christ. It's very non-denominational. It's a powerful book. I always recommend it to anyone who wants to sample her writings or who needs reassurance of God's love for that person. Steps to Christ. And whenever I recommend a book, I gently suggest read chapter 5 first, then read the rest of the book. Steps to Christ. A close second would be the desire of ages. But it's very intimidating in its size. But it's a tremendous blessing. Steps to Christ is small. It's manageable. But when I think of a large Ella White book, young people read Harry Potter and it's twice the size. And it's not a problem for them. So desire of ages, fine. But Steps to Christ. My favorite Bible verse, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Let me tell you why without preaching a sermon. Look at the verse. Let's pray again. Father, as I continue trying to answer questions, give me a fresh supply of wisdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth. Now we have God and we have creation. Do you see that in that verse? You sure? We have God. We have creation. Creation is the result of God's work. God is not the result of creation. I'm not saying that clearly. Oh, you're sleeping with your eyes open. Let me say it again. 
Creation is the result of God's work. God is not the result of creation. Are you following me? So we have God and we have creation in that verse. Now, listen again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's everywhere. When Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, he meant everywhere. And so God made everything everywhere. But here's God. Here's creation. That verse tells me there are only two ways to exist. You're either, you're either, you're either God or you're part of, that's it. You either exist as God or you exist as a part of creation. There isn't a third way to exist. And the principle that should exist between God and creation is plain and simple dependence. Creation depends upon God for its maintenance. By the way, that is the Sabbath principle. I depend on God. Not God on me. And so in that one verse, ten small words, I see a lot. God, creation. When a person, Lucifer was tired of being a part of creation. And so he said, I will be like the most high. If he had said, I will be like a lower angel, he would still have been created. Am I confusing you? Let me put it this way. Here's the angel Gabriel. Here's an amoeba. If the amoeba becomes a bee, is it still created? Is it still created? Yes. If the bee becomes a butterfly, is it still created? If the butterfly becomes an eagle, the eagle an elephant, the elephant a blue whale, and a blue whale becomes Gabriel, what hasn't changed? They're all created. So essentially, to change your state, the only option you have is to be like God. That's what Lucifer wanted. All of that I see in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. And for him to create, he had to have been there before what he created. So I love that verse very much. The next question, uh, this person's asking about your personal testimony and how you came to know Christ. Oh, very simple. I, uh, my, I was a Catholic as a little boy. My mother found out about the Sabbath. She was immediately convicted and struck and went in search of an Adventist church, a Sabbath-keeping church and found an Adventist church. A friend of ours, bless you, was an Adventist. And we just went to his church and the case was closed. I was a little boy, had no choice, and I'm glad I had no choice. I have no date for when I individually gave my life to Christ. It just happened. Well, no, no it did just happen, but... I have no date, no particular thing. There were no thunderclaps, no flashes of lightning, no, nothing of the kind. I just, at an early age, decided this is true, and I want to follow it for the rest of my life. So it's not a spectacular story at all, very boring, <laughs> but uh, that's mine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is, what does the Bible say about anger? The Bible has nothing, well, <laughs> do you have your Bibles with you? Go to Proverbs 16.32. Proverbs 16.32. What does the Bible say about anger? Proverbs 16.32. Who wrote Proverbs? Did he write all of them? No. Who wrote Psalms? Did he write all of them? No. Okay, do you have Proverbs 16? Verse 32. Someone who has my version, read verse 32. Yes, right over here. Stand up. All right, read nice and loud. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Yes. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes the same. 
Now, they're talking about the benefits of not expressing anger, unreasonable anger. He that can control his spirit is better than the mighty or better than someone who takes a city. In other words, self-control is more powerful than military might. Now, someone else read Proverbs 25, verse 28. Raise your hand, stand and read. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Yes, my dear brother, stand and read for us. He that has no rule over his own spirit uh -huh. is like a city that is broken down. Can't control himself. Loses control. It's like a city that is broken down and without walls. Now, someone who has courage, read Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. Stand up and read. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. We're talking about anger. And when we discuss anger, we should discuss self-control. Yes. Stand and read for us. Yes. Anger rests in the bosom of fools. Unreasonable anger is the behavior of a foolish person. Notice I said unreasonable anger. Now, here is what Jesus had to say about anger. Go to Matthew 7, let's read from verse 21. Here is Christ himself talking about anger. It's very frightening. Matthew 7, reading from verse 21. Who will read for us? Yes. To my right, stand and read nice and musically. No, 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 sorry, not Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 21. I, may, I think I said 7, 5, 21. Okay. Yes. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, uh -huh. whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. Go on, but I... Uh-huh. Yes. Keep going. And whoever shall. Uh-huh. Keep going. Good. Jesus equates unreasonable anger with murder. Mm-hmm. Unreasonable anger with murder. That's Christ. So when Christ proclaimed from Sinai, by the way, it was Christ who spoke the law. He spoke it for his father. When he said, thou shalt not kill, it also included unreasonable anger. Anger is a dangerous thing. Or anger not, now does God get angry? Yes, his anger is righteous. Ours must be controlled by the spirit of God. Now go to Ephesians chapter 4. Read, I believe it is, verse 25. Ephesians 4, 25. Who has that for us? Yes, sister. Ephesians 4, 25. Read 26. Yes, go on. Now, anger is such a terrible thing. Deal with it quickly. Thank you very much. God bless you. Don't let the sun set on your anger. Don't let a day go by with the anger unattended. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Because you may hurt someone, you'll surely hurt yourself. And so we're told, be angry and don't sin. In other words, the anger that's justified is godly anger. But much, much anger is unreasonable. It can lead to death. And Christ equates it with murder. He also equates murder with hatred. And so if you have an anger problem, memorize verses that deal with anger and say them and say them and say them. Proverbs 16, 32, Proverbs 25, 28, Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Ephesians 4, 26, Matthew 5, 21 to 23. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you think God created other perfect beings in our other worlds, and we're the just the only rebellious ones? The Bible you... gives us a clue. Despite the very explicit statements from Ellen White that there are worlds where people live who never sin, in Revelation 12, verse 12, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Ye heavens. 
he that dwelleth. The Bible frequently speaks about heavens, not just heaven, heavens. Woe, therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. The heaven, we have where God is, that's where the angels live. Then there's another part of the heavens where unfallen worlds exist. People have never sinned. And they watch what's going on on this earth. They watch. Ella White tells us in uh, Desire of Ages, page 758, paragraph 2, when Jesus said, it is finished, the unfallen worlds rejoiced because his death covered them. Yes, there are other worlds where no one sinned. The only place in this vast universe where rebellion occurred, the only planet, is this one. And that's where Christ came to do something about the rebellion, to provide hope for those who will accept him. If we're faithful, one day we will see the inhabitants of unfallen worlds. You must believe that. In one vision, Ella White was taken to one of those worlds, and she saw them, and she said, How is it? You're so beautiful. You're so magnificent. They said, Straight obedience to God. She told the angel with her, please let me stay. The angel said, no, you have a work to do. But if you're faithful one day, you'll mingle with them. Go to Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah 3. Well, no, let, let's forget that. That will take us in another direction. It's okay. Next question. Okay. Uh, this person's asking, do you have any advice for student leaders? Yes. Make this your manual. Make this your manual of operation. As a student leader, there's a burden upon you to set an example in everything you do. So those whom you lead will be properly led. The concept of people being led was invented by God. The highest angel was Lucifer. When he fell, Gabriel took his place. The other angels listened to him. Gabriel tells the angels what God wants. Lucifer used to do that. And so we have this concept of one leading the other. The high priest was the leader of all the Levites. He was a spiritual leader. The apostles, the chief apostle was Peter. You read the Old Testament or the New Testament, you have elders, you have deacons. They are leaders, people who lead, others follow. But the leaders must lead in harmony with the Word of God. So if you're a student leader, your priority is to make sure that your influence is a saving influence. It is a transforming influence for good. All people exert influence. You can't stop it. The only choice you have is, will it be good or will it be bad? So if you're a student leader, let the Bible be your guide, your manual, your how-to book. And of course, read the book by Ella White, Christian Leadership, I think it's called. Read that book. But God bless you for accepting a position of leadership at a Blue Mountain Academy. It's a good experience for later life. You've already touched on memorization and also devotions. This person's asking, what is a great method for Bible study? I think I mentioned it earlier. Write it on cards. Three by five cards, write your verses. Two, put it to music. Sometimes when I preach, I ask, who can recite the, 60, uh, recite the 66 verse, uh, books in order? And some people, they have to do it to music in order to do it. Music is one way. There are several Bible passages I recite to music. The prodigal son, Psalm 91, Psalm, 50, Psalm 51, sorry. Um, other passages, Psalm 139, the pieces of music I use and I recite. So whenever I drive my car, I have the music on, I'm reciting. I'm... Revelation 12 is also, I have some music I use to recite it. Music is one way to anchor the word in your mind, but my primary method is repetition. Repetition, repetition. Mm -hmm. 
Read it. Understand it. Then get the words in order. Get the sense. Get the substance. Get the theme. Get the thrust. Get the meaning. Get the message. Then make sure you have the words in order. That's my method. Constant, constant repetition. If you try, you'll get better day by day. You really will. As in the case of anything you do over and over, you get better and better. I think you covered this on Friday night, mm -hmm. but repetition deepens impression here. It says, okay. is it possible to achieve perfect holiness here on earth through God's transforming power? Is it possible to achieve perfect holiness? All right. Go to 2 Corinthians 7. Someone read for me verse 1. Who has it? 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Read verse 1 nice and loud. Having therefore these. Yes. Stand and read for us. Yes. Uh huh. Ah, doing what? Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, note. Let's let's add to that Second Peter chapter one verse four. Let's go to Second Peter chapter one verse four as we discuss the possibility of perfecting holiness in this life. Second Peter chapter one verse four. Who has that? Yes, my dear sister, stand and read for us. Whereby? Uh huh. Yes, now, whereby these precious promises, we may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped. The corruption that is in the world through lust, through the word of God, obedience to it and study, we are brought to the place where we are perfected by Christ. We become partakers of the divine nature. Talk about perfect holiness. Go to Hebrews 12. Someone read verse 10 of Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Verse 10, Hebrews 12. Who has that? Yes, yeah, stand and read for us, please. After the own, uh huh. But he, that we might partakers. Yes, we are to be partakers of the holiness of God. Hebrews 12, verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We are to be partakers of the divine nature. Now, read Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. I'm sure you, when you see it, you realize you already know it. Ephesians, not Ephesians, Philippians 2 verse 5. Yes, my dear sister, nice and loud. Yes, let this mind be in you, which was also where? In Christ Jesus, not a mind similar to it. The same mind Christ had on this earth. We must have. And so we've read three verses. One, 1 Peter 1, verse 4. We must be partakers of the divine nature. Second one, Hebrews 12, verse 10. We must be partakers of God's holiness. Three, Philipp, uh, Philippians 2, verse 5. We must have the mind of Christ. I'll give you one more. Go to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Oh, very good. Uh huh. Ah, that we might become the. So we are to have the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, partake in the nature of God, and have the mind of. You tell me, you have those four things. Can God create perfect holiness in you? Yes. The problem is, we don't believe. Let me discuss belief for a couple of minutes. Let me stand up. Have you ever been to the dentist? Yes. Have you ever been to the dentist? Yes. When you walked into the office, what happened to your body? Huh? When he told you, sit in the chair, what, what happened on the inside? Do you start to get tense, yes or no? Yes. 
Why? What are you expecting? Pain. Pain. And he has done nothing. You believe you'll suffer. And he tilts you back flat. And you're, you're waiting for hell. You believe. Mm -hmm. You believe. It affects your physiology. Now, do you believe that Christ can produce this? Do you believe you can do what's right? Do you believe that? Does it affect your physiology? Does it affect your choices? Do you believe? The same way you believe, the dentist will make you suffer. <laughs> we have to believe. I can conquer this weakness. The Bible talks about God who calleth those things which be not as though they are. You know what he said of Jeremiah? Jeremiah verse one, verse five, chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. God saw Jeremiah before Jeremiah was conceived. Before God said, let there be light, he knew what he had in mind. You can't surprise God. When God said, let the, let the earth bring forth grass, God already saw what grass would look like. Can you see what a successful student looks like even before you take your exam? Can you see what a calm person is like even though right now you have a temper? Can you see a calm person who has your name? If you see it, it'll come out. Perfecting holiness? Yes, not in your own power. In the power of Christ, as you remain always submitted and always in his words, studying and obeying. This will produce the holiness that God requires. I said this morning, or was it last night, when God said, let us make man in our image, that standard still remains okay thank you uh, this question is is the Holy Spirit a, th a third person is it wrong to be anti-trinitarian is what this person asks <laughs> is it wrong to be anti-trinitarian that means is it wrong to oppose the biblical concept of the Trinity the answer is yes go to Matthew 12 quickly please let me pray again father I'm about to comment on a controversial subject that is really quite clear in the Bible. Give me the right words, dear God. Break down the Jericho walls of stubbornness that surround anyone's mind regarding this subject. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to uh, Matthew 12. Someone read verse 31 for me and verse 32. Ah, I have a, a good sister. Stand up, read for us. Now listen very carefully. Therefore I say unto you, all manner of? Mm -hmm. Yes. The blasphemy against whom? All right, the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven now. The, Jesus says, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven. That's what Jesus said. Read the next verse. 32. Stop. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man? Jesus. He himself says, you can speak against me and be forgiven. Are you looking in your Bibles? What does he go on to say in verse 32? Hmm? What? Yes. All right, now, in verses 31 and 32, are the two beings who are the targets of blasphemy? Who are the two? Jesus and Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you can blaspheme me. Are you with me? There's forgiveness. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost. There's no forgiveness. Then what is Jesus saying about the Holy Ghost? 
there is, come on, a Holy Ghost. Now, let us go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Someone read for me verse 18 of Luke chapter... Ah, okay, yes. God bless you for your eagerness to read. God bless you. I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. No, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Yeah. Go on. The Spirit of the Lord, go on. Stop. Are the two personalities in the words she has read? Who are the two? Who's the other one? Me, that's Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Keep reading. He has anointed me. Come on. Stop. That's fine. That's fine. He hath anointed me. You see, Jesus... Let me stand up again. <laughs> Jesus could not anoint himself. Are you with me? Yes. A priest, a judge, a priest, a king, a prophet did not anoint themselves. They had to be anointed by someone else biblical teaching. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor now. Go to the book of Acts chapter 10, right to the front to my left. Acts chapter 10, read verse 38. Keep in mind what Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me. I have one. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Acts 10, 38. Listen carefully. Ah, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we know Jesus was anointed and the instrument the Father used was the Holy Spirit. Finish the verse for us. And with power he went about doing good uh -huh. and all who were oppressed by the devil. Yes. The Father anointed Christ through the instrument of the Spirit. The Spirit is the active anointing agent. Now, someone go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. How about one of my brothers? Yes. Read from verse 1. Hebrews 5. Verse 1. Nice and clear. For every high priest Taken from a man. Mm -hmm. Notice that every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men is ordained, not self-ordained, must be ordained by someone else. Keep reading. Who can have? And sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? Go on. And by reason also for himself. Now pause. Listen to verse 4. Read on. And no man taketh this honor unto stop. But stop. Stop, stop, stop. Don't sit. Just stop. No man taketh this honor. Now, what office are we discussing? The high priest. Verse 4 says, no one takes it unto himself. You don't go and apply to be high priest. You're chosen by God. No man taketh this honor unto himself. Keep reading. But he that is, as was, yes, someone else called Aaron. Aaron didn't call himself. Now, Aaron was a high priest, representing whom? Jesus Christ. Now, is Christ high priest now, yes or no? Did he anoint himself? Who did? The Father, through the Spirit. Keep reading, verse 5. So also, yes, yes, stop. Christ did not make himself a high priest. When Moses anointed uh, Aaron as high priest, what did Moses use? Oil. The oil represents the spirit. God used the Holy Ghost to anoint Jesus as priest, Jesus on the earth, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Christ could not make himself priest. Someone else had to anoint him. The anointing power, the Holy Spirit, 
the anointing authority the Father. Are you following me? The anointing, now, if the United States goes to war, the authority is Congress, the power, the soldiers, the Abram tanks or the F-16, whatever. Are you following me? The authority, Congress or the president, the power, the military force, the authority, the Father, the power, the Holy Spirit, anointed Christ. So there must be someone more than Christ, you see. Now, let's go to Matthew 3. Matthew, no, no, let's not go to Matthew 3. Let's go to John 13. I see my sister in the green. I think that's green. Matthew 13, let's read from verse 16. Matthew 13, not Matthew, John 13. Thank you for listening. John 13, read it, no, okay, I'll come to you, but my sister here first. Yeah, I'll come to you, I'll come to you. Please don't cry, I'll come to you. All right. John 13, reading from verse 16. Listen carefully. I tell you what, just turn around. Ah, now read to the people. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, yes. a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. That's, not, that's fine, that's fine. Now, a servant is not greater than his master or his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than him that, come on, sent him. Now, he that is sent, he that sent him, who's greater? Come on. Speak with confidence even when you're wrong. Are you with me? All right. Now, let's try that again. He that is sent and he that sent him, who has greater authority? The one who sends. Listen to this verse. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the, know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Who sent Christ? Who has great authority? Now, are they two persons? Yes. The Father sent the Son. Now, go to John 14. Ah, my sister over here. Okay. John 14, read verse 26 of John 14. You know, the Bible is the most interesting book if you take time to study it. Oh, thank you. John 14, 26. Listen okay. carefully. Okay. Oh. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, yes. whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. All right. Now, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Who sends the Holy Ghost? Based on that verse. The Father. But in whose name? Yes. Now, go to John 15. Read verse 26. Who will use the mic? Ah, all right. John 15, verse 26. Well, ladies first, but since you're handsome, you go ahead. <laughs> go, go ahead. John 15, 26. Listen carefully. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you ah, from... Ah, wait a minute. Who now in verse 26 of chapter 15 sends the Holy Ghost called the Helper? Jesus. Jesus. Read the whole verse. Um, from the Father, the Spirit of truth who mm -hmm. proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Good. Thank you. In, Matthew, in John 14, 26, the Father sends the Spirit. In John 15, 26, Jesus sends the Spirit. Now, we already have the principle in John 13, 16, the one who sends is greater than the one sent. Are you with me? Yes. Then, the Father can send the Spirit. The Son can send the Spirit. There's no verse in the Bible where the Spirit has ever sent the Father anywhere. And the Spirit only directed Christ when Christ was in his humanity. But in his divinity, the Spirit gives him no direction. He was the one who sent the Spirit with the gift of tongues when he ascended. Are you following me? What am I trying to say? We have Father, we have Son, we have Holy Ghost. 
Go to Acts, not Acts, 1 Corinthians 2. Who needs a mic? 1 Corinthians 2. Oh, here you go, my lovely sister. Someone read verse 10. Well, 9 and 10. What time is it? 5 to 5. Do you have, when does the sun set? 5 or 7. Oh, really? All right. Uh, I said 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. Who's reading? Okay, my sister, I think. Oh, okay. Someone is preempt. I'll come back to you. I'll come back. Please don't cry. I'll come back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Stand up. All right. Turn around. Reforce now. But as it is written, mm -hmm. eye has not seen, mm -hmm. nor ear heard, mm -hmm. nor have entered into the heart of man, mm -hmm. the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Mm -hmm. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Pause. God has an agent that serves God, the spirit. He reveals the things of God to us. Keep reading. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Ah, now. The word search means understands, can explain. The spirit searches, understands what? Look at the verse. The deep, not the shallow things of God. The deep things of God, but prior to that, we learn the spirit searcheth all things. What are the all things? All the deep things of God, the spirit understands. Any being who understands everything about God must himself be God. Now, read verse 11. Oh. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 2. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of the man which is uh -huh. in him? Mm -hmm. Go on. Even so, no, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Yes. Whatever God knows, the Holy Spirit knows. Then the Holy Spirit must be as divine as God is, even though he has different responsibilities. Now, go to Matthew 11, read verse 27. Oh, okay, okay, all right. All right, here we go. Oh, okay. Stand up, turn around, and read for us. Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, mm -hmm. and no one knows the Son except the Father. Mm -hmm. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. Mm -hmm. The one whom, and the one to whom the Son will, wills to reveal him. Yes, now, what is Jesus saying? I know the Father, and the Father knows me. As much as the Father knows me, I know the Father. Which means that the same way the Holy Ghost knows everything the Father knows, so they're equally divine. Everything the Father knows, Jesus knows. They're equally divine, but they have different responsibilities. And so the Father can send the Spirit. The Father sends Jesus. Jesus does not send the Father anywhere. The Holy Ghost does not send the Father anywhere. And in his divinity, the Holy Ghost does not send Christ anywhere. The Spirit directed Christ in his humanity. When you have time, go to the book Evangelism. Read the chapter entitled, Misrepresentations of the Godhead. Ellen White. You will see where she clearly states, the Holy Ghost is a person. As much as the other members of the Godhead are persons. And finally, at the baptism of Jesus Christ, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. Where was Christ? In the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. Jesus, looking up to heaven, he sees something apart from himself the spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him so we have Jesus in the water 
the Spirit coming down from the heavens. And lo, a voice from heaven now. We have three locations. A voice from heaven, a being coming through the skies, and Christ in the water. One person can't be in the same place, three places at the same time. There's an ancient error that says Christ expresses himself as Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but it's the one person. Mm -mm -mm -mm. One person can't be in heaven, the skies, and in the water at the same time. Christ was in the baptismal water just coming out. He, the Bible says he saw the Spirit of God descending. Christ was coming up. That's what the Bible says, out of the water. The Holy Spirit was coming down. Two different directions. And a voice in heaven, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am. Well, please, listen to me carefully, with no disrespect to those who do not believe there's a Holy Spirit. Or The word Trinity causes a problem. The Trinity has suggested one person in three different forms. No. It is three separate individual personalities but one substance. And we have a clue to help us understand that. Genesis 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. If a man and a woman can be one, why can't Father, Son, and Spirit be one? Can you explain that to me? Why not? If a man, a woman, and a child can be one family, why can't Father, Son, and Spirit be one heavenly family? Are you with me? If you have to doubt somebody, don't doubt the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus tells you, if you blaspheme him, there's no forgiveness. And so to say there's no Holy Ghost is to place yourself in mortal danger. And you worsen your condition by trying to get others to believe there's no Holy Ghost. If you have to go to hell, go by yourself. <laughs> Don't evangelize others into hell with you. Go by yourself. Please, young people, the Holy Ghost is your friend, your guide, your convicting power, your restraining power. He's the one who opens the mind. You can understand the word of God. And he's the one who runs the work. Christ said, I will pray the Father, John 14, 16, and he shall give you another comforter. We have three. I will pray to the Father. Two. He shall give you another, meaning, you see, Christ was the first comforter. The Father will send another, so it cannot be Christ. Another means different from. If I had one apple and I said, give me another, you don't tell me, well, you just had to eat the one you just ate. Mm -mm. I need another one, a separate one, a second one. I will give you another, or he will give you another comforter. So the Father gives the comforter at the prayer of Jesus Christ. There is a Holy Ghost, there is a Son, there is the Father. In divinity, they're this way. In duties and responsibilities, they're this way. Are you with me? Look at a family. The father is a family member, the mother is a family member, the child is a family member 100%. In duties and responsibility and authority, we have the father, according to the biblical model, the mother and the child. But in substance, father, mother, child. In function, responsibility, father, mother, child. In substance, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. In duties and responsibility, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. May I just step up here? Okay. 
Uh, we've got a handful left. Um, All right. I've kind of, there's been a few questions that are duplicate, so we've set those aside, mm -hmm. or if they're very, very similar and you've already touched on, right. on the principles. So <clears throat> this person asks, and you did talk a little bit about this during one of your messages, what do you think about relationships in high school? Relationships in high school are fine if it's with your book. <laughs> your textbook, uh, yes, please. Your parents, let me get up again. Your, your parents did not send you here to get engaged. They sent you to get an education. Are you with me? Now, can you have friendships? Yes. But as I told you earlier, God put a man and a woman together, not a boy and a girl. A boy and a girl are not emotionally mature enough to, make, to handle that thing in a way that honors God. There are too many boys and girls who have boyfriends and girlfriends and uh, uh, romances for adults. Um, young adults, yes. But when you're 13 and 14 and 15, you're not a young adult. You're a teenager, you're a child. And if you behave like an adult, someone may treat you like an adult in the wrong way. Are you following me? <laughs> Let me. <laughs> Your childhood is short. Are you with me? Your adulthood is long. Everything. Don't rush this to go pay taxes. <laughs> Are you following me? Don't rush this. It passes quickly. And then you have 50 years of responsibilities and bills and whatever else. And even. Be a child if you are a child. Now, that's what you are. Don't be a child trying to behave like an adult. Be a responsible child. Yes. But don't focus on romance when you were sent for education. And so that's all I'll say to you. It's a very serious matter, getting involved with people's feelings. You may be doing this service not only to her, but to her family, who thinks that she has come to carry out the reason why she was sent. And quietly, there's some young man corrupting her thinking, or some young lady corrupting his thinking. It goes both ways. You are not yet emotionally mature. Let me tell you something about maturity. You won't like this, but it's scientific. If you don't believe me, go on, do a research with the permission of your, your teachers. Research the adolescent brain. Are you following me? Read some articles about the adolescent brain. You'll discover the last organ of the body to develop is the brain. The last one to fully develop is the brain. And the experts say somewhere between your 25, 27, 28, somewhere in there, it fully develops. It develops from the back to the front. Are you following me? It develops from the back to the front. So the last part of the brain to develop is the frontal lobe where what is made, decisions and choices. So you have a 14-year-old boy who can be a father with a brain that's not yet developed. He needs supervision. Listen to me, young people are not bad. They're just not yet mature. Let me tell you something else as I step down. Do you know why insurance rates are higher for teenagers? Recklessness. Now that recklessness isn't vicious. That person has not yet developed the ability to determine risk. Statistics have shown if a teenager is driving a car, there's a 50% chance he'll have an accident. If another teenager gets into the car with him, there's a 60% chance he'll have an accident. If another teenager gets in, there's a 70% chance. If a third teenager enters, there's an 80%. This has been studied. Why? Because all four of them have... <laughs> 
Now, am I saying you can't think? Yes, you can think. Of course. But developmentally, you're not yet at a point. So you need guidance, supervision, godly guidance, godly supervision. You can't send a 70-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl to, to, to give Bible studies. You're asking for trouble. They're nice. They read the Bible. They're vegetarians. But this thing is still developing. And so romance that requires good thinking to avoid emotional damage and long-term harm Ah, you need a mind that's ready for that. But we live in a world where everything on TV is some young man and some young girl. And they're not studying the Bible. And so, no, I don't recommend romance to be your focus, no. Mm -mm. That's just my recommendation. Chances are you're not ready. Now, there's nothing wrong with relationships. God invented them. But as I said again, he put a man and a woman, not a boy and a girl. Do you still like me a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> Next question, my pastor, I'll stay right here. Oh, yes, give me the word. Next question. All right, the next question is... Um, as a Christian, how do I act towards people who are hypocrites or fake? Okay. Well, that person just described all of us to some degree, except for the grace of Christ. Anyone outside of Christ fits that description. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. We all need Christ. We all need grace. We all need help. Again, I point you to the character of Christ. Study the character of Christ. How do I deal with those who are fake? What's the other word? Hypocritical. Hypocritical. Christ came to a world full of people who were fake and hypocritical. There's none righteous, no, not one. He came to a world of fake and hypocritical people. And he was tolerant to them. He didn't tolerate the hypocrisy. He tolerated them as weak people. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He understood their weaknesses. If you have to deal with someone you assess to be fake and hypocritical, you deal with them the way Christ would deal. You don't have to spread their fakeness, spread their hypocrisy, but you remember, I too was in that condition. When the Israelites left Egypt, they got instructions from God, treat your slaves nicely because you were a slave. And so we see a, hypocrit a hypocritical person as an opportunity to pray for that person and by your own example, lead that person to the level of sincerity and truthfulness in his or her life. But certainly, don't look down your nose and assume you're better than. You're an instrument in Christ's hands to reach out to that person, but you will run into fake people, and God allows that sometimes to test your character. Test your character. How will you react? Will that fake person see the real thing in you? Okay, next question. Uh, this person is asking, is it okay for someone who is in the military or in a medical prof uh, profession to work on Sabbath and if so, should the money earned go towards the mission of the church? We must do everything we can to avoid working on Sabbath. When I say we, I mean every human being who respects God's law. Doctor, nurse, dentist, you name it. We must do everything possible to avoid Sabbath work. But Jesus says it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And so he healed a man who had, I believe, the dropsy in, uh, I think it's Luke 14 or Matthew something. He healed that man, man with a withered arm, healed him on the Sabbath. Doing good on the Sabbath is not working on the Sabbath. Jesus never said it's lawful to work on the Sabbath. He said it's lawful to do good. Your animal falls into a pit, pull it out on the Sabbath. God is not a promoter of suffering. 
If, as a medical doctor, a nurse, some such field, you have to go in, Ellen White counsels us, Medical Ministry, page 216, paragraph 2, do what is necessary to relieve suffering and give the money earned to the church. Because you're not supposed to earn a living on the Sabbath. Now, some of us, we cleverly say, well, I'm a nurse, I go to work, because the pay on Saturday is double. Maybe twice and a half. Maybe triple. And so some of us, under the guise of, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I can go to work, knowing they're going for the money. Not so much to relieve suffering, I get double pay, triple, I can provide tuition for my child. God reads this. Do everything in your power not to work. Listen to the commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it, what are the next few words? Thou shalt not do. But if you must go in, go to relieve suffering. Whatever compensation given to you, give it to the church. Don't keep it. The moment you make an exception for one commandment, you've opened the door to make exceptions for another one. Now, we can't start that. Once that horse gets out of the barn, you can't put it back in. Do not make exceptions regarding God's law. Because someone will come up with an exception for thou shalt not commit adultery. The sinful mind is clever in developing ways to get around God's law. Very clever. It is simply a method of suicide, that's all it is, getting around God's law, because disobedience is death. But a sinful mind doesn't see that. Obey God as much as you can obey God and leave the consequences to him. Next question. This person asks, how can I stop being selfish and prideful? Look at Calvary. Look at Calvary. Start with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Mm -hmm. The love of God is self-sacrificing. I say it again. The love of God is self-sacrificing. Study that. You'll be cured of selfishness. Okay, last question. Mm -hmm. Second last question. How do you overcome the fear of public speaking? Speak. <laughs> Well, I'm serious. No, just speak. Let me ask you this. If someone were to say to you, listen, you know, whatever your name is, John, Sally, Nebuchadnezzar, whatever your name is, someone says to you, would you tell us about your family, where you're from, how many brothers, how many sisters, you know, where, you would stand up and do it. Because you'd be talking about something you know. You understand me? When you know something, it removes a lot of the fear of public speaking. When God called Jer go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1, let's read from verse 5. Do you have Jeremiah 1? Reading verse 5. No one has Jeremiah yet. Ah, you have it. All right. Stand up for us. Read from verse 5. Nice and loud. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Read 5, 6, 7. Before I formed you in the womb, mm -hmm. I knew you. Mm -hmm. Before you were born, I san san sanctified you. Mm -hmm. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, listen to the next verse. Then said I. Then said I. Said, then said I. Our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. Stop. Stop. I can't speak. Keep reading. For. For I am a Joseph. Mm -hmm. I'm a child. I can't speak. What did God say? But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm a Joseph. Stop. Mm -hmm. Don't say that. Thank you, sister. Do not say that. Unless you can prove to me, says God, you do not have a voice box. You can speak. Jeremiah said, I can't speak. I'm a child. I am at Mountain View Academy or Blue Mountain Academy. I'm a child. God says, don't say that. Because if I send you, I'll enable you. Now, go to Exodus chapter 4. 
Let's read from verse 10. God calls Moses now to go speak to Pharaoh. Yes, Exodus chapter 4, let's read from verse 10. Did you raise your hand? Oh, I'm so sorry. I have sinned, I have sinned. All right, who raised the hand? Ah, okay. Here we go. Read for us, my lovely sister. 10 to 12. Okay. Listen carefully. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh mm -hmm. my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, mm -hmm. but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Pause. Moses said, I am slow of speech. I must apologize to the camera person. I keep moving. I am slow of speech of a slow tongue. He had forgotten how to speak Egyptian. He had been gone so long. So he tells God, I can't do this. I can't speak. Keep reading. So the Lord said to him, mm. who has made man's mouth? Stop, or stop. When you speak, what do you use? Yeah. God said, tell Moses, wait a minute. You have a problem with your mouth. Do you know who made the mouth? <laughs> if you have a problem with it, I can fix it. Keep reading. Who hath made man's mouth? Or who make it the dumb or the deaf? Okay. The seeing or the blind. Mm -hmm. Have not I the Lord? Mm -hmm. Now there... Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what sh you shall say. Thank you. God told Moses, don't bring excuses to me. I made your mouth. You got a problem with it? I'll fix it. You go. I will teach you what to say. Listen to me. Anytime you're asked to speak, say yes. Regard it as a request from God through that person. The principal says, would you do a 10-minute uh, devotion? Say yes. The more you do it, the better you do it. I'm not saying you lose all nervousness. No. But you'll be better at expressing yourself. God, the greatest gift God has given to us is speech. Mm -hmm. Use it. Final question. Final question is, when can we get you to come back? Oh, <laughs> oh well, talk to God about that. Okay, okay. Well, God bless you. As, as, as the Sabbath has ended, we're just wondering, well, first of all, we just want to thank you again my privilege, for my traveling privilege. all the way from across the world mm -hmm, to be here mm -hmm, with mm -hmm, us, and mm -hmm. we praise God for what mm -hmm, he's done through mm -hmm, you. So, mm -hmm. again, as we prayed for you earlier, I just want to say a quick prayer for you now. Yes, yes. And, um, if you will be able to end in prayer and to close the Sabbath. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your servant, Elder Randy Skeet. Thank you, Lord, for using him in so many different ways, uh, for helping him answer uh, some of the questions that we have been asking. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we uh, meditate on these things, that as he's reminded us, um, we are not to go to human minds, but to go to the word. And Lord, may we continue to search your word as we behold it, Lord, we know that we will become changed. So, Lord, we just pray that you give him traveling mercies, as I know he's going to Zimbabwe, I believe, next week. Mm -hmm. We just pray that uh, your angels would be uh, tapping the right people on, on the shoulder that should be there for these meetings, that, Lord, they would be there to listen to, uh, to, for the message at such a time as this. So, Lord, give him traveling mercies as he flies out tomorrow. Uh, may you go with him in a special way. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, just a few closing remarks, then I'm done. Let's recite the fourth commandment. Exodus 20, 8 to 11, King James Version. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now God tells us, keep the Sabbath holy. Have you ever been to a museum? If you ever go to Paris, go to the Louvre and see those famous paintings. The, 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 the museum keeps them holy. The museum protects them. The museum treasures them. The museum understands their value, and so they do everything to keep them safe. God tells us, here is the only day I made holy. Now, here it is. Take care of it for me. Keep it holy. Handle it with care. It's precious to me. 
It's the only one that, re that, re that uh, tells you who I am, the area of my influence, and what I did, my title. Who I am, creator. My influence, heaven and earth. My name, God. And God says, I am asking you to take care of this precious thing for me. I'm not asking you to make it holy. You can't do that. I'm asking you, preserve its holiness by your speaking, your thinking, and your behaving. Take care of it for me. This is an act of trust. I'm going overseas for two weeks. I have a Lamborghini. Would you take care of it for me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> huh? You won't treat it like your Ford Focus. Are you following me? This is a Lamborghini. Take care of it. If a fly rests on it, you shoot the fly off. God says, here's my Sabbath. Take care of it. How many of you will say, Father, by your grace, I'll try to take care of your Sabbath day. Can I see your hand? Ah, God bless you. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. Before I pray, any prayer requests, just raise your hand and tell me. Yes. Wisdom and understanding. James 1.5, wisdom. Yes. Grades and time management. You want to be a physician? Okay. Luke was a physician. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Okay, your father's faith. Okay, discernment for him. Your family? Your what? Your spiritual life. Make, oh yes, wise decisions, yes. Your, your what? Oh yes, yes, yes. Your non-believing mother, ah, okay. Your health and for your What's wrong with your arm? Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Your family and? Determination. Oh, det oh, determination. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. Your who? Your grandmother, okay. Your unbelieving brother. For our friend's health. Your what? Oh, friend's health. Okay, I'm coming over. Yes. Okay. Your friend? Your brother? Your studies? Your brother? Your who? Your grandfather? Future plans and? Your patience to love, yes. Your mother. Yes. Who? Your family. Your, your dad's work. Your unbelieving father. Your mother. Unbelieving family. Ah, wisdom and self control. Yes. Your father. Leadership, leadership, leadership. Okay. Students thinking about baptism. Students thinking of who's considering baptism? Can I see your hand? Come, come quickly. Special prayer. Come, 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 come. You're considering baptism? Come. And if someone will make a decision right now, you come. Amen. Right now, come. God will pray especially for you. Mm -hmm. God is happy. You're considering baptism? Come, come. Come, come, yeah, come, 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 come. Ah, God bless you, God bless God needs young people. The devil has so many of them. He needs them. You know, the Bible says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, but Satan also wants you when you're young. If he can get you now, chances are he'll keep you. If God can get you now, chances are he'll keep you. Anyone else considering baptism? Come, 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 sister, come. Just let God see that's how you're thinking. Anybody else? You're considering it. Come. Just come quickly. Then I'll pray.
Anybody else considering it? Okay. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you personally for a glorious weekend with your sons and your daughters at Blue Mountain Academy and the administrators. Father, if in any way I did not represent you well, forgive me. I present to you now the young men, the young women, and all the concerns for family, for health, education, self-improvement, leadership, self-control, parents, grandparents, unbelieving. Dear God, the angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke 137, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. You told Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? You can bring those unbelieving family members to Christ. You can heal that dislocated arm. You can provide the self-control. You can give the skills for leadership. Father, whatever the request is, they go, it is not beyond your power. And so we ask you now in the name of Jesus Christ, who is human as we are human, who represents us in his name, Father, begin working in the lives of those who made those requests known. Now, God, these young men, these young women are considering baptism. You are pleased. Again, in the name of Jesus Christ, who himself was baptized. Let them only become stronger in this decision. And this determination, let no power, friends, family, or anything else change their minds. Bless them. Again, I ask you to bless this institution, Father. Bless the conference in which it sits. Bless the leadership. Let the words heard this weekend long remain in the hearts of your people. Save us when you come, Father. Until then, keep us faithful unto death. In Jesus' name I pray, let God's people say, Amen, amen. and Amen. I love you. God bless you. And if I don't see you again, I hope we'll meet when Jesus comes and he is coming. <laughs>